things of the research that I've been doing for the past couple of years. I have just finished up my field work, so all of this research is a bit new, but I'm going to talk generally about the causes of abandonment of the system. I'm going to talk about my main question, which is, is the Khatata system a sustainable solution for Oasis agriculture in the face of climate change issues around the world? So to start off, what is the Khatata system? At its base function, the Khatata is a technology that allows water to be brought from the underground aquifer to the surface without using any external source of power. So if you think about when you dig a well, you have to be able to pull that water up and that pulling action is a source of power. Either you have to pull the water up or something has to pull the water up for you. However, the ingenuity of the Khatata is that it allows water to flow just with gravity from an underground source to the surface where it can then be utilized. There are several important physical structural aspects of this system. First is again, this underground canal that brings the water from underground to the surface. There are these ventilation or access shafts that are spaced periodically along the underground canal. There is an outlet, and then there are these irrigated areas or where water is brought throughout a community. And so I have some lovely photos from my field work to better help illustrate these ideas. Um, so I think the Khatata system is something that makes a lot more sense when you see what it looks like. Um, this is the underground tunnel. As you can see, it can be quite large. This photo here um, in the center with me for scale, but it can also be quite small where you're actually crawling on your hands and knees to get through it. Um, the underground canal will slope from an aquifer to the surface. The water is entirely gravity fed, and this underground tunnel can be from a short distance of 100 meters to up to 40 kilometers in length. It is a very phenomenal feat of engineering. Uh, when it was first constructed, usually these systems are earthen, but watered ones in Morocco are often reinforced with concrete or stone lined um, to help keep them from collapsing. The ventilation and maintenance shafts are sort of what people think of when they think of the Khatata. They're very recognizable features on the landscape. A lot of them will look like these mounds of earth that are up here in the upper left corner. And this is from when you dig them, the earth will come out. But across Morocco, they can again be incredibly varied. They're often concreted, they can be lined with stone, and generally they're very, very beautiful. They provide access to the underground tunnel and can be from a meter deep to up to up to 30 meters deep. They are, are quite, quite deep systems. Um, and their two main functions are for cleaning and maintenance, um, and as well as access. So the access to the underground tunnel is important because it allows for you to get into spots that are far away from the outlet without having to walk several kilometers underground. And access to the tunnels, as you can see here, can be done just through earth and handholds, which are carved into the side of the shafts. Or you can have here in the bottom left, you can see stones were placed in the stone line ones that allow people to sort of walk down. But a lot of the more modern systems in Morocco will have these concreted sides and then rebar has been placed in it. And you can see me in the center after coming up out of a shaft being very grateful not to be underground. Um, another main function is these shafts are used for cleaning because a lot of the underground tunnels can be blocked when debris fall in or root systems have gotten into the tunnels. And so it's easiest to clean them via these maintenance shafts. And there's a lot of evidence of cleaning that can be seen along active Khadana systems. These will be piles of dirt that have been pulled up from the shafts. And another main problem with the systems that they face are roots from palm trees getting into the underground canals and blocking the sources of water. So a lot of cleaning of Khatata system involves removing these roots. The outlet, as I mentioned, is where the water goes from being underground to above ground. And this is often just a simple structure, but sometimes they're very elaborate houses or or things placed around the outlet. Once water flows from the outlet to being above ground, it will often pool in a reservoir and it will collect here to be used for agriculture, for domestic use, for all of this. And from the reservoir, it is transported through the fields and through the communities through a complex series of canals known as the Segia. Um, and these canals uh, allow water to be brought all over the place at different times. And this distribution of water is done at a very communal level and it is called the Nova system. So the Khatata functions in a way that the water is communally thought of. Nobody owns the water itself. They own sort of a time slot within the water cycle. They're able to have sort of two hours on a Wednesday, three hours on a Friday to irrigate their crops. And these are inherited water rights. And the whole physical structure of the Khatata system surrounds these, these communal water rights, allowing for water to be distributed um, to whoever's time it is that day. Um, historically, water was calculated. The time that you had was calculated through sort of different techniques. The main one in Morocco is called the tanast, and this is a copper bowl that has a small hole in the bottom, 
And if you set it in water, it will slowly fill up over an increment of 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And you'll have maybe two scoops of water, three scoops of water. And that was how the NOVA was calculated. Another method is this uh, stick that was used to measure the depth of the reservoir. So your allotted time might be you know, two to three centimeters. And so the person who's in charge of managing the system would make sure that the reservoir had gone down the proper amount before the water was then redirected to another family plot. A third system, which is not the most common in Morocco, but I have seen it a couple times on my survey, is a rock that is used um, the shadow is used to designate whenever the NOBA is um, time to switch to somebody else. But again, the ones that are most common are the reservoir stick and the tenast. Once the water reaches the fields, it is usually irrigates um, Oasis agricultural fields. And Oasis are often designated by having three main trophic levels. You'll have the palm trees, which provide a level of shade and also date palms. Um, underneath, you'll have uh, sort of fruit trees, nut trees, kind of those things. And at the base, you'll have cereal crops, carrots, vegetables, all of those things. However, the Khatara system is not just an irrigation system. It's important to note that it is a source of water for a community. So there are physical aspects to the system that don't have anything to do with irrigation. And I call these daily access areas or domestic use structures. And so a lot of these, what they'll look like are cups placed along the Segia systems for people to drink. Sometimes you'll have stairs that have been built down down into the underground canal where people can go and pull water for cooking, they can pull water for drinking when they're in the field, sort of these things. And then there are also laundry structures. And laundry structures will often have a very important part within the, the physical structure of the khatara. You'll be able to see it right at the outlet. It's a very important part. And so it's sort of the thing that I've been looking at in my research a lot is these domestic structures and how important they are, as well as it being an irrigation system. And so generally, the physical structure of the khatara shows that it is a system that is designed to be communal. It is locally designed to fit the needs of the community, and it is built with the landscape. Each khatara system is incredibly varied based on what the terrain looks like, what are the needs of the community, what the landscape can provide. The community cares for a khatara system, and in turn, the khatara provides water for the community. And another sort of background thing that I'd like to talk about is the historical narratives of the Khatara. And this is something that is going to be a little bit difficult because this system itself is very hard to date. There's nothing within the Khatara system that makes it easy to date archaeologically, historically, or any of that. And if you're ever to read any sort of article, any book, go to any talk, you will likely see this diagram because it is the most commonly sort of believed theory about the dispersion creation of the system. It's known across the world for a lot of different names, but its most common name is called the Qanat. And a lot of people argue that the Qanat was developed in the 6th century BCE in the uh, Iranian plateau. And from there, through a series of empirical expansions, slave trades, community to community connections, it kind of spread across the world, but it had this origin point in the Iranian plateau. However, there has also been a lot of scholarship recently and archaeological evidence and research that has shown that this might possibly not be correct. A lot of countries are arguing for there being independent nodes of development that are not connected to this central sort of diffusion point out of Iran. And so one of those is actually in North Africa. There's been an extensive work being done in Libya that argues that there's a a pre-Arab development and even a, like one of the oldest developments of this system. China has also argued that they have the oldest one and there are some in Peru that um, they argue predate. It's a, it's a very complicated history and no one quite has the answers yet. Um, but the Khatara system can be found through 46 countries around the world. It often has a local name depending on what country it is. In Morocco, it's called the Khatara. Across North Africa, it's often called the Fogara. In Oman, it's called the Aflaj. In Iran, it's called the Karez. If you get into China, it's called the Kanjaring. In Spain and in Central and South America, it's often called the Galerias. And in all of these countries, there are systems that are in use, um, and there are also systems that are in disuse. And it kind of depends on where you are, how many systems are still being, being used today by current farmers. In Morocco, the history is also not quite well known of when the Khatara was first used, who used it, all of these things. There are three main theories, and everyone will tell you that 
theirs is correct. Um, the first main theory is that uh, the Chassada system was first used around Marrakesh in around 1100 CE, and that it was brought to Marrakesh via a Spanish Andalusian engineer who was hired by the Almoravids to sort of create Marrakesh as this capital city. And so he built those very long, very impressive Chassada that you can see around Marrakesh. However, a lot of scholars will argue that there were actually earlier Islamic origins across Morocco um, that well predated this, uh, predated the construction of Marrakesh, and they'll usually argue around the 8th to the 9th century. However, there's been a lot of study that argue that um, there might be even earlier origins of this system in the country that were um, used by the Amazir people. And again, these are connecting to a lot of the studies that have been done in Libya and Algeria that show that this system, the Fogaada system, well predated the arrival of the Arabs. So again, it's one of those things that no one quite has the right answer, and it would require a lot more study. But these are the three main theories of sort of when the Khatada system was first used in Morocco. But what people do know is that the Khatada system allowed for historical settlement of arid and semi-arid areas of the world. So areas where there was not river, where there was not frequent rainfall, all of these things, where there wasn't a spring system, the Khatada system allowed for people to create settled communities to produce agriculture, all of these things. And the studies of this system allow sort of historians, archaeologists, geologists, all of these people to understand the development and movement of technologies, as well as historical agricultural practices and adaptations to changing, changing climates. And so after I've given that hopefully very brief introduction to the Khatara, I'm going to talk a bit about my research and how I became interested in this topic and how that has sort of formed and led me to the research project that I am presenting today. So I first came to Morocco in 2017 on a study abroad program. And the first thing that I was really entranced by was how similar the two landscapes felt. The landscapes were very similar, the cultures were very similar in ways that I was not expecting. And one of the ways that I like to show this is these six photos here. Two of them are from Morocco and four of them are from my hometown of New Mexico. And I'll often send this off to people and see if they can guess who it is um, or which one is which country. Uh, the top two are Morocco and then these bottom four are New Mexico. So you can see that the landscape is quite similar. But the thing that I was incredibly drawn to was the similarities between these irrigation systems that I had grown up with. In New Mexico, they're called the sequias, And I mentioned here in Morocco, they're called sequias. Um, and I was just sort of fascinated by how the culture surrounding this irrigation, the, the construction of them, how water was managed, all felt very, very familiar. Um, and that kind of just got me intrigued. And these have led me to the, the Khatara system itself. And this research project that I've been doing has spanned the last six years, but the one that I'm working on right now has spanned the last three. And I did a large remote sensing project, ground truthing field work here in Morocco, and then a series of ethno-archaeological surveys. The remote sensing project uh, was done through my University of New Mexico. And what I did was I looked at satellite imagery, freely available public satellite imagery on Google Earth um, or Google Maps. And I tried to find and map as many of the Khatada systems as I could see. As you can see, they're incredibly visible just by their physical structure. Um, but I basically started by looking at any mentions of Khatada communities in articles, reports, news sources, historical um, accounts. Uh, I would look on Instagram, Facebook, and blog posts. I would sometimes look up hashtag Khatara and see if anyone had mentioned it in their community, and that actually allowed me to identify a few sites. But my goal was to basically identify as many Khatara systems across Morocco to get a really holistic understanding of where it was used and who was using it. As I was doing this, I was also trying to identify if you could tell via satellite imagery whether or not the Khatara system was still active. And this is something that um, has been done previously in other countries, but I was seeing if it could be applied here in Morocco. Basically, you look at whether or not the system has productive agriculture at the end. You can see here that these systems in image B are all very, very abandoned. They haven't been used in a while, and there's no agriculture at the end. Versus this one in A, which you can't quite see on satellite imagery, but it ends in this very productive agricultural oasis. The other way in which you can tell are looking at the ventilation shafts themselves. As I mentioned, Khatara systems that are still in use will often be cleaned, and the evidence of this cleaning will be shown in very clearly defined rings, as well as dark ventilation shafts. Um, Khatara systems that have been abandoned will have a less clear shape to them. And overall, this map, or this project resulted in this map, which I'll talk a little bit more about in the results, but this was just trying to understand sort of the distribution and use of the Khatara system about Morocco. 
After creating this, I came to Morocco via the um, Fulbright Grant and the American Institute of Maghreb Studies. I'm working in my master's at the University of New Mexico. And then I'm affiliated with an organization based out of Tefraut that is called AIDCO. And through this, I was uh, able to do a project that was based in a theory of archaeological research called community-based research, which in sort of advocates for uh, involving descendant communities within the research practice themselves. And the Khatata system is a really great system to use this sort of archaeological practice because the heritage structure itself is often still used and by people who today and people whose parents have been using it and grandparents have been using it. And so the heritage structure is deeply intertwined with the community itself. And basically what my uh, community-based research meant is that I went out into a lot of communities that I had identified on the remote sensing and with members of the community, if this was farmers, if this was people who worked in the local associations, if this was just people who I had encountered um, through the, the massive WhatsApp network of Morocco, um, they would sort of walk the system with me and they would explain the different histories associated with it, the problems that they've been facing, sort of all of these different uh, aspects of the system. And I wanted to have this be an important part of my research because I think archaeological research specifically and a lot of research on a whole into the Khatata system has often remo removed the voices of the community members who are still using it, despite the fact that it is an incredibly community-based system. And so for my research project, I wanted to make sure that the voices of people who are sort of at the forefront of this, who are using the system every day, who are deeply impacted by this research, were the ones who would get to sort of tell their stories. And uh, throughout my Fulbright, I was able to visit around 468 Hadada systems throughout 96 communities in Morocco. Um, you can see here in the map, uh, the systems that I visited are the blue triangles, and then the ones that are in yellow are people that I was able to do interviews with, but I wasn't able to go see the system itself. Um, I focused mainly on the anti-atlas because that is the area that has received the least amount of scholarship attention. There has been several reports in the Tafalaut, but the Khatar of the anti-atlas were sort of less, less researched. Um, and then here are the results of this very large project. The first part of this project was looking at how many Khadada in Morocco. And this was actually a really difficult question to answer because it is not clearly standardized how to count these systems. A lot of scholars will count them based on the outlet. A lot of people will count them based on the mother wells. And a lot of people will count them on the individual branches. And as you can see in these examples, this can be really different results based on what part of the system you're counting. In Tizki, you could get three, two, or five. In Tajante, you could get three, eight, or 20, I don't know how many branches there are. Ogog is nice because no matter how you count it, you get one. But generally, um, there are, if you're counting the outlets, there are around 2,000 in Morocco. If you're counting the mother wells, there are around 2,700. And if you're counting the branches, there are around 3,300. Looking at the status of the Khatara, there are around 520 communities who, this should say, has used them and continue to use them um, throughout six provinces. Uh, between 21 and 34 percent of the Khatara in Morocco are still in use, and this was uh, something that I calculated using a statistical analysis of the actual data itself, as well as comparing it to my ground truth results. So as you can see, it's not an insignificant number of people who continue to use the Khatara system across the country. However, this story does show that there is a mass wave of abandonment happening. And a lot of the systems that I visited have gone abandoned within the last couple of years. This is not something that's happened a long time ago. It's something that's happening right now. And the three main things that I was able to identify as the reason for the abandonment of the Khatara were one, drought and desertification as a result of climate change, two, the installation of modern technology such as the pump well, and more the overuse and exploitation of water using the pump well. And then three is emigration and social change. And so a lot of the abandonment of the Khatara depends on the fact that the Khatara requires a very stable aquifer level. Um, and the aquifer is something that is recharged annually, usually by snowmelt in the high atlas. Uh, but if the recharge is not able to happen, the aquifer level can drop and therefore the entire Khatara system can become sort of unusable. One of the ways in which uh, an aquifer level can drop is through drought, just not enough rainfall. And in Morocco, as everyone knows, there has been there has always been droughts in Morocco, but recently within the last 30 years, as a result of climate change, the droughts are happening more and more frequently and they're happening with a lot more intensity. And so as a result of this, a lot of areas that are already very um, sort of on the edge are experiencing a, a very drastic effects of these droughts. 
The pump wells, however, are something that is affecting the Khdada system even more. These were technologies that were introduced to Morocco um, during the French protectorate around the early 1900s. And there are some benefits to the pump well. They're able to provide more regular and consistent access to water. However, the issue with them is they go deep into the aquifer and they pull up water very, very fast. And this disrupts the natural cycle of recharge and can very easily overexploit the aquifer. And what this means is that if you have sort of 100 people using one Khtada system, and then you have one person put in a pump well, say for a watermelon farm or just for their own personal consumption, that one pump well can drop the aquifer level enough that all 100 people who were using one Khtada system now no longer have access to that Khtada. And now all of these 100 people who want to continue doing agriculture have to start putting in their own pump wells. And that just continues the cycle of overexploitation of the aquifer. And a lot of the pump wells in these areas are not regulated. There is illegal pump well usage and placement all across Morocco. And another big thing is not actually about the physical structure itself, but it's sort of emigration and social change that is happening in these communities. And a lot of that has to do with the introduction of newer technologies and the privatization of water. As I've mentioned, the Khatada system is a very communal system that relies on the community to care for it. However, as water becomes privatized and people's sort of views of this system shift, uh, it sort of disrupts this ability for this system to function. Another issue is a lot of emigration to cities uh, has resulted in there not being enough people to clean the canals. And therefore, if the underground canal gets blocked and there's no one there to do it, the Khadada system might again become abandoned. And I think one of the things that I want to point out from my research is that in a lot of these areas, drought was not the major reason for abandonment. It usually was uh, over exploitation of the water via pump well. The communities that were still using this system will often have significantly less pump wells and do truly have a communal view of water and sort of those things haven't changed. The Khatadas historically is a much more drought resistant technology and has been able to be continually used through long periods of historical drought. Um, and so that was sort of one of the things that was sort of really striking to me in my research. However, this is not to say that the Khatada system is not, not still used all across Morocco. These are two heat maps that I've shown of where the areas where they're most abandoned and the areas where they're most likely still in use. Um, and in all of these communities that I visited that are still using them, they still do strongly hold this communal view of water. The Nova system is still in place. This idea that the, the Khatada system belongs to everyone in the community, that the water belongs to everyone, um, is still held very strongly. A lot of these places will practice sustainable agricultural practices um, and uh, sort of have this idea that the Khatada system and water in general is something that works with the landscape rather than against it. And this allows for them to be in very volatile areas and work in very harsh landscapes and be able to provide food and water and all of these things for their families. And another thing that I'd like to talk about is something that has been sort of unique to Morocco and a lot of the scholars that I've talked about in other countries have not seen this. And this is the communal pump well. And this is something that I think is uh, an answer for a lot of the issues in these communities, because the truth is that, is that currently there's, there's just not sufficient water and the Khatada system is often not providing enough. However, oftentimes in the communities where the Khatada system is providing not quite enough water for the community to get by, a local association will put in one pump well, and that water will then be pumped directly into the Khatada infrastructure, and therefore the communal system is still preserved, and they only pump enough to be able to sort of balance out the water that is not being provided by the Khatada. And then when the when the rains do come, when there is sufficient snow in the, in the high atlas and the aquifer can be recharged, they can turn the pump well off. And therefore, it's not continuing the cycle of overexploitation. So this is something that I've been seeing across Morocco, and I think is a really good sort of stop gap when you have a Khatada that is not providing enough water. This sort of lets the Khatada be in use long enough until the drought is able to end and like the waters are able to, to come via the rains. And I think just as a sort of a thing, the Khatada systems are very intricately tied to the oases across Morocco and that the death of the Khatada is not just the death of this irrigation system, but it really does often catalyze the death of the oasis. And the oasis is so deeply tied to how it has functioned historically that the installation of modern technologies, all of these things have not been able to sufficiently provide for these areas. And this is something that a lot of places around the world are looking at. 
Um, in a lot of countries, there has been a push to return to traditional sources of irrigation, traditional ways of agriculture, as they are a lot more sustainable, they're a lot more drought resistant, um, and a lot better for very rural, very arid areas. Um, and so UNESCO has a whole program based out of Iran, they've established a whole center there, and there's a lot of them across the world. Um, and generally, I think I'm going to wrap this up uh, so we can get into questions, but my research uh, has really just been focusing on looking at the dispersion and use of the Khatata system in Morocco and understanding sort of its, its role in this, in this country. And throughout my remote sensing and my field work, I've been able to establish that at least 21 to 34 percent of Khatata systems are still active and that they do still play an important role in many communities today, and that this system is a much more sustainable and drought resilient system than a lot of modern technology such as the pump well. And the Khatata system has allowed for life in the desert for thousands and thousands of years. And I believe that if managed properly, if continued properly, if people want to continue using it, it can allow for life in the desert to continue for thousands of years. And so that is my presentation. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for the insightful presentation. I think it, uh, as we're, we're uh, watching your presentation, it probably raises a lot of questions uh, in terms of uh, all the viability of the, the Khatara systems in Morocco, the current status and, and the future of Khatara systems and what we want to make of them. And they certainly served uh, a huge part in uh, the development of civilizations like uh, I can think of cities like Marrakesh and that wouldn't probably exist without the existence of these networks. Um, so now is really the question of like, well, where do we want to go with these uh, Hatara systems? And so, um, yeah, I'll, please feel free for the audience just to put in questions as, as they come. And uh, I'm pretty sure Emily's happy to answer any questions. Uh, maybe I'll start off with the with a question that just one of the last things you mentioned was the some of the unique aspects. I'm, I'm curious because this Khatara system spans over a huge uh, many like uh, uh, several countries from Asia to to across the Atlantic Ocean. And you said that the communal uh, pump wells was a unique aspect uh, that you noticed in Morocco and I'm just curious, like, why why do you think that that's uh, that's something that is relevant for Morocco and that is probably not something that was useful for other? If, if you have the the answer to that, um, but yeah, just uh, just interested to hear your thoughts about it. Yeah, so that's something that I've also been fascinated by, and I think there's a couple of things that play into that. One of which is how the Khatata system is viewed in terms of heritage, and I think a lot of people that I've talked with in other countries, there is not a practice of modernizing the Khatata, and so all of the Khatata systems, for example, in Oman, are entirely earthen. There are very strict laws against any sort of change to them. They are the same system that they were when they were first created you know, however many hundreds of years ago. However, Morocco has a, a tendency to sort of upgrade or modernize or change the actual structure of itself. One of those is the, the cut and cover method, which I see a lot. And that's actually where they excavate the entire Khatata system. They dig a giant trench through it, and then they'll rebuild the structure with concrete. Um, and this was done for several reasons, one of which was to try and stop a lot of the cave-ins. It was thought to be safer if the whole structure was made of concrete. Um, they thought it would help prevent loss by seepage of the water and things like that. And again, it's, it's a, like a, a good thing and a bad thing because while it does do those things, often it will negatively affect the actual water cycle. Um, if the Khata, like aquifer level drops, it's hard to completely destroy and rebuild the, the concrete. And so I think the pump well kind of falls into that, that idea of upgrading and continuing to modify the Khatara system. And another thing I think is important and unique to Morocco is the local associations. And I think there's a lot of people, there's actually a scholar here, um, Kirsten, who is doing a research project looking at all of the local associations, NGOs um, across Morocco from being very, very small ones to bigger ones and how they work within the sort of communal, uh, a lot of these communities. And I think this is something that is also very unique to Morocco is how much power and how important a lot of these local associations are. And they're the ones who are putting in the communal pump well. So I think it's a combination of, of heritage practices and heritage management, as well as the power that local associations have in Morocco. 
Thank you. Thanks. Um, <laughs> maybe just another question. Uh, um, the when we think of the abandonment of of Khataras and and just thirty percent or around thirty percent still still uh, being used, uh, I. I I know that the government is trying to rehabilitate and just uh, bring back some khataras to life, but I, I guess that's the process of just reviving this khataras. It just doesn't happen just through infrastructure itself, because some of these practices, I guess, have been lost in some a lot of these communities, right? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a lot of things that go into rehabilitating a khatara, and it's a, it's a quite an expensive process, which is why it's something that uh, is not often considered in communities where it's gone completely inactive. And then the other thing is if it's been abandoned long enough, a lot of the communal practices and a lot of those um, aspects of the khatara become lost as well. And so one of the, the projects that I mentioned in UNESCO, the center that they've created in Yazd, Iran, one of the things it does in terms of rehabilitation is not only provide funding to restore the physical structure, but they also will bring in members of the local community and they'll train them in the necessary ways, sort of these ancient ways of managing water, the ancient ways of construction, and then send them back out with the support necessary to their communities to manage the water. And so restoring and rehabilitating the system is not just restoring the physical structure. It would require restoring a lot of these, these, like shifting back to a communal understanding of water, shifting back to a different way of approaching life in, in very uh, arid areas. So I think you're, you're right about that. Thank you, thanks. Uh, we have here uh, Iman and, and Adil with us who are also members of the committee uh, of our chapter of the Iowa Young Water Professional Chapter and they're helping me today with questions. Um, maybe I'll, I'll let uh, Adil uh, share his uh, question if he has one, or Iman, whichever. Uh, Iman, okay, you can start. Uh, thank you. Okay, start with that. You can start. Iman. So we, I, I just said that we have some uh, questions in the chat box, but uh, you can start. I can uh, read the questions from, from the audience. And I also have a question. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. Thank you, Talha, for, for giving me the this this part to ask questions to Emily. And thank you, Emily, for being part with us and share your experience, your field experience here in Morocco. So really glad to, to hear this and to, to witness this presentation. My question is a little bit academic. It's concerning that if you publish an article or something like that in the in some um, uh, scientific papers, so it's, is it a, a scientific uh, collaboration between Moroccan uh, universities or just like um, a field work you do it um, maybe for, for your own purpose or some for your uh, like uh, scientific um, purpose in your university? So is this like a collaboration effort between a Moroccan university and the US and the American university? And if this uh, not a population, uh, we are like glad to have the links in order to have um, a deep uh, knowledge about the topic. And thank you, Omota. Yeah, so I think your question was asking about sort of my affiliations and collaborations with Morocco. And I have uh, many, and most of them have been focused within the local communities themselves. Um, and my main affiliation is AIDCO, which is a local organization based out of Tefraut. Um, and they've helped facilitate a lot of the, the site visits that I've done, a lot of the interviews, a lot of the areas with that. And there's a several ways in which the collaborative process uh, I've approached throughout my research. The one of which was for every interview that I did, every community that I worked with, I always asked them sort of how my research could be most beneficial to them directly. And a lot of the things that they asked for were GIS maps to be created because they were able to then sort of apply for funding. Having these maps, they asked for reports, they asked for informational brochures. And so one of the things that I'm working on now with these communities is creating these site forms and sort of reports that have as much information compiled as possible about their systems, about the histories, about the structure, about the difficulties that they're facing, and then all of these get sent back to the communities themselves. And so that's one of the ways in which sort of I wanted my research to be incredibly impactful and helpful for these people who have been so helpful and generous in hosting me. The second thing is that I've been working with a lot of scholars based out of Ibn Zahor University, 
Um, and we're hoping to be able to sort of do localized uh, reports and surveys about the Khatara system itself and publish those. Um, and so a lot of my work I'm hoping to get published with a lot of scholars that I've worked with here in Morocco, as well as creating these reports that I hope that you know, uh, communities can use to apply for funding or help with their Khatara systems as a whole. So I hope that answered your question. Um, I think Iman has, has another question to ask. Your mic is muted, uh, Iman. Sorry. Sorry. Uh, we have a few questions. Um, let me just check if that works. So we have a question from Leila who is asking will your, will your research be available for review anywhere? eventually, and uh, what recommendations would you give to preserve the Saras? And also, do you see a way they would fit into Morocco's development uh, strategy? Okay, so I'll Sorry, try and answer. That's a lot of questions. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> so I guess for your first one, um, I am hopefully, I actually have a article right now that is about my remote sensing um, that I'm hoping to get published in the Journal of Archaeological Science. And if anyone wants that from this, uh, please let me know. I'm happy to send it. I'm also trying to find a way to put my GIS data in a way that it is publicly available so that scholars can continue to build on this work, um, because I think this is sort of I'm one person in a whole cacophony of people around the world who are starting to look into this system. And so I would love for this to be able to be a lot of jumping off points for future scholars. Um, in terms of recommendations for preservation of the Khatara, I think that um, things that I have come across and uh, things that would be beneficial is one is really management of how many pump wells and how many sort of extractions of water can happen in these areas. And I think that that is something that needs to be sort of more closely managed. I also think that financial support would be very good because historically, a lot of the positions of the Khatara were something that were volunteer based, they were communal, but in our today's society, that is not often something that can be continued and that people do need to be compensated for this kind of work. The position of, of someone who manages the water, the Amazel, um, in a lot of places that actually has become a paid role. And I think that that is something that is important because it is an incredibly important job. Um, a lot of communities will uh, actually, the local associations will raise baraka to uh, be able to pay people, the youth who are cleaning the underground canals. And so I think financial support um, on a higher level to be able to make these positions uh, sort of a paid position within a community would be something that would really help uh, preserve the system. And I also think just just knowledge about these systems will help us preservation because a lot of people don't know that they're there. A lot of people don't realize how integral they are to these communities. Um, and so I, it is my hope um, that the more people who talk about this system um, and who continue just spreading the word about the Khatara and all of this thing and how people use and continue to use traditional irrigation systems across the world, that it will continue to help people who want to use these irrigation systems have the ability to continue doing so. Um, and then your third question is about um, fitting into Morocco's development strategies. Uh, this one, I'm not entirely sure how to answer. I do know actually that as a part of the 2023 Morocco uh, agricultural plan that just came out, they're hoping to do an inventory of the uh, Khatara across Morocco um, to sort of see how it does fit into the country. And so I think that there is sort of this, this continuing of understanding of traditional systems and their role within uh, agriculture and oases in Morocco. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we also have another question. Uh, do you think dams have any kind of impact on the use of the Sahara? Um, Definitely. I think that the dams, um, one of the things that is difficult with them is they do tend to have a negative impact on the recharge of the aquifers of uh, areas that are downstream of the dam. So if you don't have enough water sort of going through these uh, rivers, the aquifers themselves around the rivers can't be fully recharged. And when the aquifers can't be fully recharged, things like wells, things like systems, um, things like spring systems will often have 
really negative effects because of it. One of the things that I saw, which was a very drastic example of this, was in Tehmert, which is near Gilmim. Um, and they had just finished the construction of the Fask Dam out there. And the two spring systems that fed Tehmert um, were sort of actively dying within those three months process. So I had come there and the man who was showing me out there, Brahim, he had crouched down next to one of the spring systems and had poked at it. And he said this was flowing just yesterday. Um, and it was, you know, there was no water coming out of it when I was there. And so I think that was one of those very concrete uh, moments where you see just how drastic the effects of something like a dam can be. Um, and it mostly is just, it's because it affects the recharge cycle of the aquifer. It really disrupts that natural cycle. Thank you. Thank you so much. I personally have a question about, uh, because you spoke about uh, Tara's uh, preservation and uh, sustainability. Since uh, the use of Taras requires both physical effort and uh, also unique know-how. So, uh, do you know if this uh, know-how is passed on to, to younger generations? For example, through uh, awareness campaigns or training younger people? Yeah, so historically, how the knowledge was transmitted was just sort of genealogically, it was from father to son, from grandfather to son, and this was sort of something that stayed uh, in the family. But as there was this disruption around the world in a lot of use of this system, it has been something that has required sort of a more like teaching process and that people need to sort of relearn this. And this, um, I haven't really seen anything about this being done in Morocco, but there are organizations around the world that are doing this again through workshops, through official schools, through all of these sort of things, through just informational flyers and things like that, because it is something that has been disconnected, that sort of line of how things were normally passed down. Um, and so I think that's what a lot of organizations are looking at is how do you train people in this kind of knowledge? Um, and so the organization that I work with, AIDCO in Indian Tizgi, one of their projects that they'd like to work on is a training center because they think that it would be incredibly valuable as a way to pass on this information to, to sort of the youths in the community, especially in Tefraut, is just a different way of training people because the world, you know, it is different now. And so there just needs to be a different way that this knowledge is passed down. Great. We also have oh, thanks, question. Emily. Yep. Go ahead, Iman. Um, sorry. Sorry, Talha. We have another question from Adi, uh, who asks, uh, did you get in touch with uh, Andy Zoa? This is an for artists in Morocco. I'm sure they will be glad to collaborate, and that could, be, and that, uh, could provide you with more data. Yes, so I'm actually uh, going to be attending a conference that is uh, hosted by them next week in Warzazat, and this will be the first time that I'm able to officially meet members of Ondaza, and I'm very, very excited because they've been someone that I've been hoping to, to meet with and collaborate. So yes, next week I will be meeting with them. <laughs> Perfect. That's great. Um, oh, over. Well, maybe, over maybe in a, I was, I was I was thinking uh, for maybe regions or areas where uh, restoring khutaras into their uh, original use is probably not as relevant. And I'm thinking mostly Marrakesh because that's yeah. where I'm now. And we have neighborhoods like Mohammed or uh, mostly like, uh, east or southeast of Marrakesh that where well, khutaras have basically have been uh, uh, neglected or or there are like golf courses or developments that have taken uh, their place. Uh, I'm thinking now there's this trend of ecotourism and this huge uh, interest in uh, in uh, in this alternative uh, tour tourism. Uh, so maybe there's 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 uh, or there are other ways to to make use of the khutaras and make them uh, useful for for today or for cities where they're not relevant anymore. Yeah, it's funny that you bring up ecotourism because uh, for people who do the like three day Merzuga tour, um, one of the things that you can do is actually go underground the Khatara systems outside Jorf. And these ones are all abandoned, but there's a lot of tourism that has popped up around bringing tourists sort of underground into the Khatara. Um, and so I actually had a friend who just did one of the Merzuga tours and he got really excited because he was like, oh my God, Emily, I went underground in one of the Khatara. 
So that is, I think, one way in which uh, Qatada systems in those areas are experiencing tourism. But another thing you've mentioned is um, just people are interested in different sort of forms of agriculture and all of this. And so AIDCO, the organization that I work with, they are collaborating with a group, an international group called Slow Food. And Slow Food does tourism throughout the world and it's called Slow Tourism. And one of the things that it focuses on is looking at these sort of different agricultural practices, different sort of styles of living that are a lot more sustainable. They're a lot sort of, again, slower, it's called slow food, but it's trying to understand that the way that we do the world right now, which is very fast, which is very sort of, you know, producing things very, very quickly and producing new things and consuming things very quickly might not be the best and might not be the most sustainable. Um, and I think the Qatar system fits perfectly into that. Um, it is something that shows a very different lifestyle um, that people have been using for a while that does not fit into that very fast paced mindset. And I do think you're right that the that there are a lot of Qatar systems that are not going to ever come back to life, like the ones around Marrakesh. The Qatar system is not a viable option for providing water for Marrakesh anymore. Um, it is just it is not sufficient for the number of people that live in Marrakesh or the infrastructure that Marrakesh requires. And so things like that um, for bigger cities, I think the system is definitely not a viable option. But for rural, arid areas who want to continue living in this sort of practice, um, the Qatar system does provide a way to do that. I think you're muted. Uh, it's easy to miss that. <laughs> well, thank, thank you. Thank you for answering that. I don't know if we have any other questions. Um, well, one, just like I'm curious to know the process of also like how 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 did they build these Qatada systems in, in a time where they didn't really have any surveying systems or any advanced tools. And when I see like a when I see a tunnel, a sloped tunnel, that go extends 30 kilometers into the mountains. Uh, I'm basically wondering, well, first how how they built that, but also how they maintained the slope that they chose uh, wisely to make sure that the water comes to the city. Yeah, no, I think that's one of the most amazing things about it is, is truly a feat of engineering. And I think a lot of people have done extensive studies on how they calculated this, how it happened. Um, and, you know, it just it really is very, very impressive. And I think in terms of how it started and sort of how it came from that is that in a lot of areas where you look at the much shorter ones, um, it does logically actually make sense as a natural progression from a spring or a well. Um, and so a lot of areas in the anti-atlas that I visited that had much, much shorter katara that were a lot more manageable, um, they had a spring system that had gone dry. And so they just simply extended it by digging a tunnel. And then if you just extend it more, you can dig a tunnel. And from there, it seems like there's this natural progression that can happen to create these long, longer systems. And so that's one theory about it was just sort of this natural progression of understanding the landscape and your springs went dry. What do you do next? Uh, but there is another sort of body of literature that argues that the Khatara system in Iran were actually mining techniques and that people were trying to get precious minerals out of the mountain. And then they realized, oh, this mining technique allows for water to flow. Um, and so, yeah, those are kind of the, the two theories of how it started. But how people are able to build them this large is really just impressive. <laughs> They are, they are, and that's certainly a reason to to uh, value having them as a legacy of, of our uh, uh, ancient and vernacular systems and, and uh, infrastructure. Um, yeah, so uh, I don't know if we don't have any further questions. Uh, we can. Yeah, I guess there's a couple people in the chat um, who have asked questions that I can answer later. So I'm actually gonna put my uh, email address so people can reach out to me afterward um, if they have sort of any additional questions. Um, one person is actually at the University of Oregon uh, and I went to Portland, Oregon, so I'd love to talk with you, Layla. Um, so yes, feel free. I put my email in the chat to send me an email. Um, I'm happy to answer any additional questions. I'm happy to send you all my data. 
uh, I love sharing data. So anything that I can be of help for. Well, thank you so much, Emily. I think you're also transitioning to a new role. In, uh, right? A are you role. staying in Morocco? To Yes, yeah, yes. so I just finished my Fulbright last week um, and I will be staying in Morocco for an additional three months on the American Institute of Maghreb Studies grants. Um, mostly I'm going to be compiling my data as well as doing some archival research. And this is where I'm hoping to meet with a lot of the organizations here in Rabat because I've been mostly in Southern Morocco for the past nine months, very detached from a lot of the centers of, of business and things like that. So I'm hoping to just spend these next three months doing a lot of networking, seeing who might um, enjoy having like collaborations, data, sort of all of data sharing, all of these things like that. So it's nice to be back in in the center of <laughs> of, of Morocco. Yeah, that's definitely going to be a new chapter to yes. <laughs> a new area of Morocco to explore. So uh, yeah, congrats on finishing your work, and uh, thank you again so much for for volunteering your time and and sharing yeah, your uh, findings. You and yeah, thank you so much again, and thanks everybody for for attending. Uh, it's been great uh, to have you with us and yeah, so hopefully we'll see everybody again uh, for future webinars. We're planning to have more of these as a way to share uh, what people are exciting projects people get involved in in Morocco about water and also uh, sharing knowledge and experiences. So thanks again, everybody, and uh, have a beautiful rest of your day. Thank you all so much for coming. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Emily.